Hello everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks of all for turning up. Um, you don't know what you've signed up for for me. I'm going to ramble on now for about uh, 20 minutes about some things I care deeply about. So. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to want to introduce you to who we are because I know like, there'll be some awareness of who we are and we've sort of come quite a long way in the last 13 years roughly. And although uh, we've kind of always been known as this hyper casual publisher and developer, um, we've been expanding and going in different directions quite a lot over the past few years. So I just want to give sort of a brief overview of who we are before we get into it. But... We have a very simple mission statement which is pretty much making the most fun games for the world's players. Uh, it's very straightforward, and I think it's it's accurate to what we're all about. We just generally see that this is a very uh, straightforward business in a way. Like, it's all about making things that are really engaging, making really fun stuff that's really sticky, and the kind of thing that people want to continuously come back to. We just keep it simple around the So we've sort of like, we're a global publisher. Um, we've been around for a, a, quite a while, like I said. We sort of like start, first started exploding around 2016-ish, the um, 17-ish, when Hyper Casual became a really big thing. And Hyper Casual is kind of what we're best known for, as I mentioned. So very snackable games, games that can sort of be put out on the App Store in a very rapid period of time. Games that uh, don't take very long to build either. And this has kind of like been our MO for a very long time. Over the past few years, we've sort of gone in new directions, uh, but we have some some fun numbers, uh, like a billion downloads, which is a threshold we crossed really, really recently, which was a really exciting one for us to get over. Uh, that was a very, very big milestone for us. Over 50 games published on our App Store's accounts. We're also launching some PC and console titles now, so that if you're into like AA indie games, the kind of Steam games um, that you, you and your friends can sort of get together and do the co-op, or some cool single-player experiences. We've got some really nice games in the, in the pipeline coming up, so Definitely take a look at that as well. However, I'm a mobile person, so I'm going to talk about mobile games. Uh, we have some sort of big games like Draw It as well. 100 million downloads on that. Recently, 100 million downloads on Teacher Simulator as well. So some big numbers on some of our apps. Uh, but we, we're also an international team. We've got four offices around the world. We're based in uh, London, no, not London, based in the UK, in Leamington Spa. Uh, but we also have actually an office here in, in Lisbon, in Armada. Uh, we also have an office out in Beijing and Bangalore, which is one of our big sort of operational teams uh, and studios. All of us sort of working together in different departments uh, across the whole uh, across the whole business, trying to make really really cool stuff. Uh, some accolades <laughs> I'll put on there, but keep it keep it nice and show off what we've been doing. But yeah, we've been we've been working really really hard trying to get some of those best publisher awards, and we have indeed collected a few of them. So we've had a few good years, and it's been it's a really really good run. Uh, and yeah, we've, we've also been highly involved in things such as women in games as well, like trying to get super involved in the community as much as possible. It's a very common like thing for us to aim ourselves at helping community-driven projects and initiatives, so very, very proud of some of those, uh, those things that we're involved with too. So anyway, on to what I kind of want to talk about. This talk is, is about something that's happened this year and sort of leading into the back of the end of last year. Uh, I don't know, obviously I'm hoping I'm talking to sort of a mobile crowd, but if not I can kind of like go through a few of these bits. But hyper casual games, very small games, very straightforward to build if you're familiar with them. Uh, think Flappy Bird, then times it by a hundred sort of thousand for how many apps like this that have come out since then, how much it's evolved uh, in that time, all the way back in 2014 up until now. Uh, these games are primarily marketed driven by uh, user acquisition, so uh, putting them out in the world and paying, uh, heavily spending a lot of money in aggressive marketing campaigns in a very short amount of time. Uh, the advantage is that we can build these games so rapidly and in high volume that we're able to sort of make quite nice margins on those apps when we launch them. So, in a lot with a lot of apps, they're actually a very profitable endeavor. So we've sort of built a very strong pipeline of games like this. We found these to be really, really strong. However, this year has been, like I said, a period of transition for us. Uh, and indeed, for the sort of micro industry that we're in, um, we're in sort of we have always been in this little sort of hyper casual corner of the industry, which is now starting to branch off as we start to sort of see challenges emerge, which is something I want to talk about a little bit. 
And this is where we started in the hyper casual era, up until about a year ago. We were very much involved in this hyper casual era, starting again about 2016, up until you could argue the golden years were up until about 2020, 2021, 2022-ish, 20, that kind of time. Uh, and this is kind of the tenets of those games. Some of those, pretty much every game on here would fit into that hyper casual category. Some of our, some of our games there, like Perfect Coffee and Airport Security. But in essence, these games are all about very quick sessions, about being highly accessible. So games that we don't, we don't really need to necessarily worry about someone looking at them and not understanding what's going on. We try and rely on very accessible visuals, uh, and accessibility is a big tenet of these, and has continued to be a huge big tenet of what we do. Uh, they have to be visually appealing, very satisfying controls, very easy for us to put in front of somebody, that they understand these things the moment they see them and they can just pick it up and go. We're showing these games in, what, about three to five seconds in the UA campaign. Uh, we need to convince as many users as possible that, number one, they understand what's going on, but number two, that actually looks fun to play and engage with. So it is a huge art form in actually trying to work out what kind of art, what kind of visual appeal, what kind of even design and mechanics and fluidity of those mechanics can attract enough users into these apps uh, so that they can get in there and they can get in there and have a good time. Uh, so these are sort of like a, it was a bible for a very long time, and still we hold these tenants pretty dearly uh, in terms of what works and what we know works. Um, this is sort of one of our one of our hyper casual games. Tell go. So you look at this, and I, I can sort of immediately tell you like what this is. It's an immediately identical theme. Uh, it's all about like, tow trucks. It's a very relatable everyday theme. Um, it's very very simple, as you see. There's not exactly the most complex level of visual detail here but we don't really need that level of visual detail. What we need is very key aspects of, of the gameplay that we can show off in the theme, so that anybody, be it an eight-year-old or a five-year-old, can look at that and intrinsically understand what it is that they're looking at, find the fun, um, and sort of go, take it from there, more or less. Uh, so, unfortunately, <laughs> we've, over the past sort of year, started to see hyper-casual struggle, uh, as, as a number of our competitors have. They are still, profitable games, you can still make money on hyper casual. Uh, we got into hyper casual because of sort of a boom in the market. Like there was a real gap for us to fill. We filled it very well, but it did very, very well during that period. As time's gone on, the the market's generally approached a point of saturation, but also just in general marketing struggles such as the big IDFA changes uh, on iOS. Which essentially means that uh, it's been very hard for us to pin down users, very hard for us to market to certain users. Uh, these changes, but any change to marketing in a hyper casual world has dramatic effects on the viability of these games. So it means that we've had a look at this landscape and we've sort of come to the conclusion that hyper casual has been great. Uh, we want to keep marketing them and where we can, but our focus is shifting and our focus is sort of shifting in a new direction where we can see some quite interesting new possibilities arising. Uh, and as, as pretty much highlighting why, why that is. Like, we've always had the advantage of rapid development. Um, the rapid development is something that we've geared our studios up to do. Uh, we've pretty much built our development teams internally, and indeed we recommend that our ex the external teams that we work with are built in an incredibly lean way, and a, a way in which they can try as many ideas as possible in a very short amount of time. That's something that we're now reconsidering uh, altogether in terms of how we approach these games. Um, as we look into getting more complexity into them, which is something I want to get into a little bit. So this new opportunity that we're looking at is generally what I started to notice popping up on my LinkedIn feed, for example, and in some of our competitors' newsletters and some of our own research. This term hybrid started to sort of appear in our little corner of the industry. And what that actually is has been quite hard to define, and even internally for quite some time, early on, we were quite struggling to stay on the same page on exactly what this was. Um, but to boil it down, these hybrid games are pretty much taking everything that we love and love and hold dear and the strengths of a hyper casual game, a hyper casual core gameplay loop, so very accessible, very easy to onboard into, very easy to play, very easy to recognize, and we're marrying that into what is actually casual and mid-core product models. So from anyone from the world of casual and mid-core, Something that's obviously um, huge games, kit the likes of King, that have been carrying carrying these games forwards over the past decade, right? Um, we have been looking at some of those product models implemented by casual teams, 
and casual outfits. And we've been thinking about how can we combine these simple, accessible, marketable core gameplay loops that allow us to target these massive audiences. And those users who stick with us through that journey, how can we give them something to reward them for their time? So we started to look at some of our backlog, and we started to look at some of the games which we're launching. We've always been very concerned with the day zero to day seven experience, which is where you make the majority of your money in a hyper casual game. By the time you reach day seven, you're not really looking at having that much much left in the sort of as it starts to flatline your LTV. But we still have good retention around on, on many of our apps around that mark, sort of like ten to fifteen percent in some cases, on very simple games. And we start to sort of question um, what the what we can do with this, um, as it seemed a lot of our competitors did. As it became harder to launch new apps, the validity of our current apps became more interesting to us uh, as, as we started to look more into these. So the solution that we've kind of found, this is called sort of like highlighting the difference between between how we're thinking about these games, where we're coming from in hyper casual, where we're going into with this new hybrid possibilities. With hyper casual, we've been used to these rapid development cycles, very very rapid, trying to turn as many prototypes around as short amount of time as possible, trying to get a bit sort of the biggest bang for our buck with what we have. Uh, and therefore, trying a lot of things and having a very rapid mindset about how we approach development. Uh, it's very prototype driven. It's all about just how can we get something shipped in as quick a time as possible. Our internal team is very very good at this. Um, they've, they've historically been able to ship stuff in a week, if that, uh, been able to do very, very well in getting stuff out in front of people. However, that is also something that's now changing, um, in all honesty, as we look into hybrids and as we start to learn the lessons from this. Um, but we had a very, uh, as, it, as it says on the slide, try, uh, instead of sort of sitting and reasoning, just try it. That was the sort of the whole mentality at Quali. You got a cool idea for a mechanic, you sit down, you can get it pitched in front of the team. If it's in publishing, you just sit down with the developers, brainstorm all of the possible ideas that are out there that we can think about. Just try it, just make games, don't think about it, don't try to justify it. The data will justify it if it falls within the genre of what, of what it is that we're looking at. So it's a very, very rapid approach. Hybrid is all about extending out the, com the content of these core gameplay loops, however, borrowing some of those classic features, those meta layer features and end game features that Cash and Midcore kind of thrive on and where they make all of their money from. And as a result, we've quickly sort of started to realize that just trying it isn't really good enough the moment you start sinking serious time into these projects. You can't really build sort of a day 30 scope project if you have no sort of clue exactly like what's backing that up beyond that core, which was enough in many cases for Hyper. So I, mean, I sort of have this completely different mindset approaching this, this sort of new, this new style of uh, this game that's appearing or has appeared over the last year. Um, we're considering content more than ever before. Sometimes we would call it quits on uh, packaging up the content of a hyper casual game in a very short amount of time. Uh, now content is kind of the name of the game. We just want players to constantly have something to be progressing onto and enjoying. Um, this is kind of like a, I think, fairly understood tenet of mobile um, in terms of how uh, design is approached on a lot of mobile games and something that we were using in Hyper but we're continuing and doubling down now on for how we think about hybrid and I wanted to put it up here because I just think it's really important. Um, it's sort of this three-stage approach to your players and your player base and how we think about attracting them. I would argue that in Hyper Casual we were only super concerned with the hook and maybe the habit if we're lucky. This has suddenly become sort of much more relevant to us as a publisher and as a developer as well as we start to think about how we can keep these players engaged for a very, very long period of time and keep them coming back to the game continuously. As I mentioned before, like we were looking at some of our hyper casual games and realizing, oh wow, like some of these guys are playing for like 30 days and it's not an insignificant percentage of users either. But if we only have interstitial ads and a few limited art rewarder video ads uh, as a way of monetizing those games, then they're kind of we're not making significant gains there. There's clear gaps with the user base that we actually already have. So what if we can fill those gaps? And that's where this sort of this sort of like habit to hold is starting to become much, much more important for us to think about. The monetization strategy is changing quite a lot with how we think about these games. Um, these these hybrid style games, hype has always always been like 97% ads. It's a sort of like a 3% IEP strategy. Um, ads is kind of the name of the game, it's how we drive it. It's all about those small margins, as I mentioned. 
But what we're kind of looking to do, especially in sort of our internal team and publishing team, is get a really nice divide between how these games are actually going to monetize the developers and how we're going to make some good, some good revenue out of them. Um, IPs is obviously going to be a huge portion of that. But you can almost think of our monetization strategy for hybrid titles and what I would highly recommend thinking about it and what we've learned is almost like a graduation process. When someone's onboarded into the game and a hyper casual game and they're making, uh, you're making pretty much all of your money off these interstitial ads, that's great. You can actually continue to use that strategy as we sort of realized with some of our more recent launches. Um, but then those users will taper off, right? Those are sort of the mass audience that you're bringing into the game in the first place and starting to engage with the game. Uh, but then we want to sort of move them on or literally graduate them by the point of day seven into the sort of rewarded video slash IP users. So by the time uh, they've played through the core gameplay of day one to maybe day one to three, uh, gone through those core gameplay loops, uh, they've started to already start to look at the really interesting things that we're offering in terms of rewarded videos. You want to think a lot now about how we can take content, really engaging, enticing content, dangle it in front of players so that they start to not monetize off of interstitial fully, but actually offer of rewarded videos. And we've seen a wealth of data out there that suggests players really like to watch rewarded videos if the reward is good. Like that's that's almost seems to be a fact at this point. There's a keen uh, interest in engaging with an ad if the reward is good enough. So already this is kind of informing your design decisions, and like how you're thinking about the game, like what you want to portion off. Um, into, into this sort of category of monetization, um, where you want to place these things in the player's journey as they go through their journey in these games. Um, but then finally, the sort of final portion, which we eventually want to finally graduate our users into, is the IMP portion of everything, where we're fully, in many ways, taking users from a hyper casual game into a casual game, where they are now logging in, this is, their, this is their hobby, this is their habit, this is something that they are doing continuously over and over and over again. Uh, every single day, they're engaging with the game, they love it, we want them to love it, and we give them all of the possible benefits of doing that through the amount of content that we now provide them. Uh, but the exchange for that is that these users are much now more likely to engage in your in-app purchases. And this is almost, we, we now think of this as almost layering whole new gameplay experiences at the end of these games. That's kind of been a little bit of a target and goal that we've had, is that users who get all the way through to this end game should ideally be motivated by something entirely different than what they actually started out with. So this is what we're targeting and working towards, this very nice divide between ints, RVs, IEPs, so that we can sort of enjoy the best of hyper casual, but also the best of casual as well. It's something that we've seen have quite interesting results as we move towards some of our big soft launches this year. Uh, so earlier this year, we made this change sort of official. Um, we had sort of a webinar at the beginning of this year where we, we announced that we were sort of shifting away from hyper casual. Uh, it's kind of important for us to do that because we've been working with so many developers over the course of years in which we've been talking to devs and working with devs and pushing through games through our pipeline. Suddenly to sort of up and say, actually guys, we think these games are going to be the future, so we want to sort of talk you towards these, it required a little bit of explanation. So we had this sort of big webinar at the start of this year where we announced this change, uh, sat down and explained to all the tenants about how we're changing things and how we see hybrid games looking. Uh, I think one of the main things we've highlighted is that we're taking more risk with these things. I think one advantage of Hyper was that we were relatively risk-free in certain regards because we kind of expected a number of hits to come along for every failure. And we had this very fail-fast um, view on game development. Um, find the failures so you can find the successes, like get through the failures, shovel those out of the way. With these bigger games and with the, the vision we're expecting developers to have and for us to have for these games as well, uh, because we, we want to think about these things as sort of passion projects as well. Um, we just want to understand exactly what the plan is. <laughs> like we, we actually want to sit down and think about our due diligence process and think that these games are going to be we're going to be able to find them and they're going to make sense all the way through. Uh, whether we can understand it before we even sign a contract or put it into production. So it's a little, almost a more hands-on approach than ever, really. Uh, we were, have always been a very hands-on publisher, uh, especially with external devs. We've been a publisher that's always been the one that's gone to the devs, sat down, invited them into calls, imparted wisdom <coughs> that we that we made this ask that we can just make the right suggestion that will turn the game into the right sort of direction. Um, but now it's even more hands-on because it's 
it's just so much more intense. There's so much more layers of content to these games that we've got to be that had to be thought about. That we want to make sure when something comes onto our pipeline, developers and external partners who come and partner with us have exactly what they need and the sort of confidence and knowledge that they'll be able to they'll actually be able to take this thing all the way through. So we also have just spent a lot of this year actually explaining this transition and what these games are to as many developers who will listen to us because it's a very very interesting um, time really in terms of our pipeline. So we now because we now we have the ability to more than ever with these games take them straight to market depending on the stage of development that they're at. Uh, a key difference there between that and hyper casual which we found hyper casual be very rare for us to see hyper casual game ready to go to global launch. Uh, it's possible we, we have seen a few of them. But you really want to find the new stuff. Therefore, the majority of hypercasual projects came out of the top of the pipeline. Uh, whereas we are now seeing this stuff come up later down the pipeline. This is kind of like, I think, a good comparison of what, what the production, or like in terms of the bulk of, uh, of games that come through these pipelines, may look like. Hypercasual is just an absolute storm of prototypes, of which a very minute portion will actually end up getting published. And that's OK, because we've been testing so, so many of them. Hybrid's much more selective, so we expect more stuff to go to global launch. We just expect it to be a much more diligent process of testing our things out. Um, we expect not so much of the marketability tests that we've seen before, sort of rapid testing or that sort of thing, or prototyping, but a single test where we optimize one game and one game only until it's, it's with the developer until it's able to get to the point of launch. So as a result, um, between the two, sort of the process change that we've started to see, Four sort of standard phases before, um, where we would always start with like a marketability test for a, for a hyper casual game every single time. We need to know if the marketing is good in order to make it work. But it would then fly through very, very quickly down that, down that launch trajectory through the gameplay test, soft launch, global launch. Hybrid, anything can really come in at any stage. Um, we see that quite frequently now. Contract can come in at any stage as well as a result of what we're offering out to developers. Um, whereas it was pretty standard before. Um, we're seeing much, much more interesting things as a result. So in terms of actually what the lessons we've learned from this has been, and like what our perspective is on this as a team, it's definitely been a big shift over from quantity to quality. And that's never to say that we didn't have quality before, that would be ludicrous to claim that. But the idea is that we were so geared up for mass publishing, uh, publishing of mass apps, as many launches a month as we could possibly foster. We've kind of always had this throw it at the wall and see what happens. Now we're trying to sort of change that mentality, lose this let's just try it mentality that we've always had, try and have a more of an accurate feeling, like an accurate workout and a proper, proper sit down and due diligence <laughs> process to everything that we do, so that we really understand before we, before we sign something or before we put something into production, that we are really 100% behind the game, we really believe it's going to work that have survived a green light meeting internally with our team. We all sort of follow and we believe in the developer's vision for the game. Um, but also, like, we're just a lot more scrutinizing than we used to be. Um, that let's just try it mentality has always served as well. This year it's proved a real challenge to get past and to sort of evolve into a let's not just try it, let's just sit down and make sure this is the right game to do. And if it's not, we just have to be honest about it, find the right project that we can put into production. Uh, but what, one sort of major thing that we've realized is that making hybrid casual games, these games that was just sort of a marriage again between the core gameplay loop of a hybrid game, the product model of a casual game or a mid-core game, it's much closer to casual than it is to hyper casual. If you come from a hyper casual background, I guarantee uh, it's going to be not as simple as you probably think it's going to be in terms of how you approach this. It's not as akin to what you're used to in hyper casual. We've had to relearn a lot of things this year. Um, we've had to really sort of seriously reevaluate. Coming out of this year, we're in this really sort of good place where we're seeing some great games now come out, so the fruits of their labour. But approaching it, we've had to learn an awful lot about almost going back to basics, back to the casual tenants, back to the mid core tenants, thinking about what made those, those games work versus how we were geared up uh, for, for the sort of hybrid, uh, hybrid casual or hybrid casual experience. So the lesson that we've ultimately learned throughout this entire year has just been hyper casual was it's almost like very very unique ecosystem 
I'm now breaking out of that and going into this hybrid to, to casual territory. It's very much just like learning more of this, uh, learning what has come before, re-educating ourselves, really sort of learning these sort of things. And this is the kind of thing which we're really trying to evangelize and preachers to anyone who will listen, especially developers who are coming out of hyper casual for the first time. Um, it's been like a very transformative experience for us. And that's generally what we're looking for as a result. Sort of a vision, not just a game. Uh, reinvented hyper games for, for hybrid, games that had a life in hyper but maybe didn't make it, that we can reassess and see if this is the kind of thing that we can now bring forwards into the world of, hy of, of hybrid and that hybrid process. Devs that are really passionate and capable. I think passion among developers is something that cannot sometimes get a little bit rarer in mobile, but what the developers who we've always succeeded with and who have had the longest relationships with and have published games with us have been the developers who have the most passion for what it is that they're doing. And it's something we can't really stress enough, is that having a passion for that vision is going to make a huge difference, especially in these bigger, longer-term projects where you're really developing for a much longer period of time than you would on a hyper project. Sort of the evidence of that vision to back it up as well is very, very important to us. Um, we really want to see a pitch now. Like It used to be that we would just want to see a test and some data. We want to understand the developer's perspective more than ever. Like, what, why are you making this game? What's the justification for making this game? A lot of us from that hyper world, it's, it's, it's a world in which we just want to try things, we just want to try mechanics. And as a result, it can get a little bit intense. But we're now sort of in this world where, where really it's all about the quality of the games that are coming through and the belief that they're going to work coming out of it. And that's about it. So thanks for listening to me, Ramble, uh, for all this time. Uh, thank you. We have time for one question. So, oh, okay, your hand went up. You're the lucky man. <laughs> okay. So, if you go back to the uh, comparison of the process for hybrid and hyper, that you have a slide for that, uh, at which step do you test marketing for a hybrid? At which step do you test marketing for a hybrid? I think the answer to that is what stage of development are you at? Um, I think we would always want to do like a confirmation to, uh, check on, on marketing results because if you could have tested something, for example, you could have had a game that you tested maybe a year ago, we need like an updated source of KPIs. If it's a new project, however, uh, it's really, we can do it at the same sort of level as a hyper casual game, like the brief prototype that's made just for the core gameplay loop. Nothing has really changed there. The core gameplay loop is still super, super important. We want to know that there's a lot of faith in that. So the answer is as quickly as possible, right? Because at the moment we have something that comes out of Unity and it can be published onto the store. And how have you changed the, the benchmark for hybrid compared to hybrid? We have, yeah. So the benchmark is definitely different now. Uh, we, can get a, we can now get away with a lot higher CPIs. Um, retention, uh, long-term retention is definitely something we're more interested in than, than before. Ultimately, what we're really interested in, though, is ROAS, like return on active spend, and like the LTV curve that, that we see. Uh, but in terms of CPI, <laughs> stuff of over a dollar is now possible if the LTV is there to match it. So, like, it's almost like a case-by-case -case, uh, again. Yeah, but it's definitely possible. Thank you.